Christianity, the religion derived from Jesus Christ, based on the Bible as sacred scripture, professed by Eastern, Roman Catholic, and Protestant bodies, conformity to the Christian religion, Euro-Gentile, psycho-philosophical, vehicle of spiritual and intellectual enslavement, has at its end three things, as I discussed in part one, the cultural racial superiority of the people who created it, the paralysis of analysis, you don't think, the perpetual empowerment of the agenda intended by it. In order for those who have been misled to begin to see correctly, you must have a clear analytical understanding of the origin of the strategies, the mechanics of the purpose and methods of the device that has blinded you in the first place. You must understand what it is that's blinding you. It is said that Harriet Tubman freed 300 slaves. According to records, she would have freed more, but if they had known they were slaves. Look, it's bad people when you look through the lenses of what your oppressor wants you to look through and think what you're seeing is the truth. When it comes to the liberation of your mind from European concepts, we must examine and re-examine those agencies that has Europeanized our thinking. Repeat this after me. When you adopt a God who is not in your own image, when you embrace literature that teaches you to hate yourself and love your enemy, when your oppressor and savior and your God and enslaver are one in the same, you become the principal agent in your own destruction. I'll help you see it if you want to see it, because everybody don't want to see it. The deception of the Euro-Gentile powers called Christianity. The creation of Christianity and the incarnated Logos Christ was not an act or event. This wasn't something that just happened. It was a process that began in 332 BC to 553 AD. Almost 900 years of progress in making this thing take place in the minds of the masses. To this day, there is no historical data, no archaeological or biographical evidence in existence to substantiate the life of anyone called Jesus Christ. Heard of John L. M McKenzie? He's an author, and by their standards, he's a scholar. John L. McKenzie wrote the Dictionary of the Bible. On page 432, John McKenzie states the writing of the life of Jesus has been a major problem in New Testament scholarship for more than 100 years. After numerous shifts of opinion, the consensus of scholars is that the life of Jesus cannot be written. The reason is that the data or historical biography does not exist. The only sources of life and teaching of Jesus are in the four Gospels in the order they were written, not the order they were taught. Mark, Matthew, Luke, John was added in the 4th century. So then how did Jesus come into existence? Let's understand what we're born into, raised by, and never really got a historical understanding of its origin. Alexander. In school, we, we were taught to call this man Alexander the Great. By the way, this is a real historical person. Alexander to me, nothing great about him. So I say Alexander the Greek. Alexander the Barbarian depends on whose perspective you're looking at. European perspective, Alexander the Great, Christopher Columbus from Italian or Spaniard perspective, you'll say he was a great man. Chris Columbus from the perspective of Native American, he was a murderer. This man was an invader. He invaded Egypt in 332 BC. Alexander the Greek went on to remove the existing pharaoh and put himself in place. Look, you just walk up to a land, take the king off the throne, and you take the throne and sit on it. But yet you had the slightest idea of what it means to be a king in this culture. He insisted that the ancient Egyptian priests would recognize him as a god, small god. Because look, Excuse me. In ancient Kemet, all the pharaohs were considered gods, small god, and Alexander insisted that the secret order of Kemet would recognize him as a god and accept him to their secret order in the spiritual institution. 
Alexander knew that in order to effectively rule Egypt, he had to be accepted to their secret order. The Egyptians had a good habit in practicing. The Egyptians did not accept persons from other races. They did not accept people from other cultures into their secret society or secret order. Therefore, the priest of Egypt was not about to make Alexander a part of their society. So what he did was he demanded that they make him a god. This was the world's first form of racism or white supremacy. Alexander died in 323. The Egyptians never did acknowledge him as a god. So guess what happened? His successor was known as Ptolemy I. But look, check this out. When you hear the word Ptolemy, I'm talking about invader pharaohs. European pharaohs that was in Egypt. Anytime you hear Ptolemy the first, second, third, fourth, those were the third invader ruler, the fourth invader ruler, and, and so forth. Ptolemy, P T O L E M Y. Ptolemy the first assumed the throne. He actually usurped the throne, but Ptolemy the first assumed the throne. His nickname was Soter, S O T E R. Soter means savior. Soter also tried to get himself accepted into the ancient Egyptian priest order, but he too was rejected. Why? Because he wasn't an Egyptian. He was a European who did not belong in Kemet in the first place. However, he found a council of what was called the Melkite Coptic Egyptians, priests of the city of Memphis, Egypt, and look what they did. And ain't that the truth like even today? No matter what, you're going to always have a group of sellouts. These Melkite Coptic Egyptians were sellouts. They sold out. They violated the ancient principles of not allowing foreign cultures or people into their secret order. These priests complied with the, re with the request of Ptolemy the first, and made a title for him. And what it did, it took the two names that were very special names in Egypt. The first was Asar, who we call Osiris. The second name was Apis, which is the sacred bull in Kemet. They combined the two names, Aserapis, and came with the word Serapis. The only place Ptolemy I was accepted was there in Memphis, Egypt. But in the other part of Egypt, they rejected him. So in anger, he went throughout Egypt and shut down all the temples. This was the beginning of the elimination of the spiritual unity that the priests of Kemet maintained with each other. Serapis was the bearded icon that became known as the savior. Pictures of a bearded Christ. Notice Jesus always got a beard. After closing of all the temples, Ptolemy I or Soter confiscated all the divine sacred writings which were written on, on scrolls and stored them in the only remaining temples in Memphis where they acknowledged him. From that time on, every Ptolemy ruler, every Roman ruler became Vicar of Serapis. Even up to today, we still have a man called Vicar of Serapis or Christ and is known as the Pope. Ptolemy V and the Rosetta Stone, 195 to 197 BC, this stone that was created by the new generation of Melkite Coptic Egyptians who made up the general council of priests and priestesses in the Dionysian Temple in Egypt, Memphis, the same city, this stone was created to celebrate the first commemoration of the coronation of Ptolemy V. And his name was Epiphanes. His nickname was Euca Christos. What do you hear popular in the Catholic Church? The Eucharist. The ritual that was created in honor of Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, Euca Christos, was called the Eucharist and attached the image of Serapis to it. So look, peep game. Here you have this image of what we know today called Christ. Now they have created this ritual of drinking some blood, eating some flesh, and attached that ritual to this image. Now you see how it's connected. The ritual also made a part of his title. This ritual became the first order of service in the Dionysian and other religious temple in Alexandria and Antioch. The Roman Catholic Church has deceived the world by teaching this ritual called the Lord's Supper. The ritual existed long before a so-called Jesus was born. The Roman Catholic Church still honors Ptolemy V, Epiphanes to this very day, in what is called the Epiphany. Same word, also called Little Christ. 
They celebrate it every year from December 26th to January 6th. And on January 6th, it's called the 12th night. The Epiphany, 305 AD, great controversy between two factions of Egyptian priests, the Melkite Coptic Egyptians, the sellouts, and the ones who kept it 100, the exterior Coptic Egyptian priests. This faction went on over the sacred writings. The sacred writings were over were of uh, Egyptian origin long before there was a concept of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The ancient sacred writings were written on the scribes of the sacred authors of ancient Kemet. They wrote the words of the gods on scrolls and kept them in the temples. And the Roman Empire became so powerful, such a tyrant, that they demanded complete access and absolute control, so they secured these sacred writings and these writings were handed over to the Roman Emperor Diocletian. This controversy centered around the Serapis image, an argument over this image, which the Roman Empire had decided to force upon the people. There was one man, thank you somebody stood up for the truth, named Arius from Alexandria, an African, stood up and said, wait a minute, I want y'all to know something here. This image, this bearded figure that has become so popular, who everyone is calling Soter or Savior, this image is a fabrication. It was made up to please the white pharaoh. People began to accept what he was saying. So from that time on, it caused problems. So it resulted in a council meeting. Constantine came into power. War was going on over this image of Serapis, S-E-R-A-P-I-S, -E Serapis. When he came into power in 323 AD, he decided to set up a council to expand the worship of this Serapis image throughout East Africa, Europe, and Southeast Asia. In order for Constantine to do this effectively, he needed the spiritual validation of the exterior Coptic religious community. He already had the sellouts, those male Kite Coptic religious community people, but he needed the exterior Coptic religious community to back him up. And look what he did. Sellout. He found a sellout. He approached this bishop named Sylvester. He went to Sylvester and told Sylvester, listen, man, <laughs> I'm the HWIC, man. I'm Constantine. I'm wanting to be recognized in this Egyptian order. But what is it about Egypt? The people still trying to get up in there today. You hear what I'm saying? This ain't just start. Something about the genius of Egypt, Africa. When they got there, they were in awe. And they want to become a part of it. But they know that they have no ancestral connection to Egypt. So they have to try to command their way in. He went to Sylvester and said, listen, man. You're an Egyptian priest, right? I need you to do something for me, man. I need you to take your authority and baptize me and make me an Egyptian through this ritual. And if you do this, man, I'm going to do something for you. So Sylvester baptized Constantine in the Egyptian sacred order. And they made Constantine a part of the belief system of ancient Kemet. Not really in his heart, but in order to rule effectively, he needed this. But the church, the Christians, they tell you Constantine became a Christian. No, there was no Christianity yet. What existed was the ancient religion of the Northeast African people. These Europeans wanted to be a part of it. Sylvester baptized Constantine, and Constantine in turn made Sylvester the head of the Roman church. Politics. Constantine's main purpose was to get the Serapis image accepted because the Serapis image was European. It was the Christ. So Sylvester began to set up his council of bishops and clergymen who went along with Constantine's program. When Sylvester put together his council to support Constantine's program, his council grew. Through this, they started the foundation of what we know as Christianity. By studying the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Constantinople, the first council of, in 381 AD, the Council of, Eve, of uh, Ephesus in 431 AD, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, when you study these councils, you see how this religion came into being. This religion is not about freeing you. The people who fabricated it know it don't exist. It's not about freeing you. 
It's about cultural superiority. Whose culture is upheld? Not the African culture, not the Japanese culture, not the Arabic culture, not the Mexican culture, whatever. Like I said, when you hear African, put your own race and your own culture, and this applies to everybody. I'm black, so I say African. You don't see Africa in Christianity. You see Africans devoted to it, but not one black contributor put anything in the Bible. Grab the Dictionary of Theology. Not one black contributor. In fact, most are German. It took 751 years from the creation of the Serapis image to 320 BC to a council of Ephesus 431 AD to transform this European image into what is known today as Jesus the Christ. The programmers know everything that I told you. But why didn't they put that in the Sunday school literature that we all grew up with? Why not? Because it's not about being free. It's not about your liberation. Only way they can maintain the power is to make sure you remain powerless. How do they ensure you remain powerless? By having you call on something that's not real. When you call on what which is not real, you don't get an answer. And if you don't get an answer, what is your recourse when you don't know what else to do? They told us you ain't got enough faith. According to your faith, be it unto you. So since we don't have enough faith because we're trying to make real that's not, we turn around and we start being dependent on the emotionalization of ourselves to make real our belief. So what happens is our practices become strategically structured to play on the strings of our emotions. Some of you listening today still may be going through withdrawal, like withdrawal from drug addiction. Not drug addicts. There's addicts in the church that need a fix. I'm not talking about drug addicts. Church is meaningless unless you're gyrating. Church is meaningless to us if we ain't trying to make the chandelier shake while we're going through our thing. Church is meaningless for some if we don't get a, hey, I should have bought a Honda, or quickening of some kind. When you're not getting information, you got to get the next best thing. When you have a predicament where the leader, the teacher, the preacher is not prepared to liberate your mind, then that person has to lean back on the only thing they know. If the only thing they know is a, should have bought a Honda, hey, hey, all that mumbo jumbo rambling, that's what they're going to go to. You got your feelings hurt on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can't wait for Sunday so you can get your feelings in check again. But for hours, you sit there and you listen and you listen and you don't know no more than when you got up this morning. The only thing that's going to free your mind is understanding a system that has imprisoned you. Once you know the truth, uh, Used to sing this song, right? Lord, deliver me. Why should I be bound? I stopped. Now I sing it with a new mind. Yes, God has delivered me. Delivered me from the doctrine of racism. The oppressor's snare. Why should I be bound? I will not be bound. Another song. My mind, my mind, my mind is gone. What does that song mean? You done lost your mind. I now, <coughs> I now sing it. The, the mind that Europe gave me is gone. Stand on your spirituality. A lot of us are suffering from spiritual and uh, cultural amnesia. We forget who we are. We forgot who we are. It's in there. I guarantee you, the spirituality they tried to give us is all based on how much indoctrination you have. It's a deep thing about us that even scares them, the African people that can't read this Bible, but have an insight, a spirituality that they can't understand because it's not documented. But the ancient African is in tune with God and the universe. We all know that movie Green Mile, right? Check this out. Green Mile is a movie about African spirituality and how they wanted to incarcerate the African spirituality and how they literally put to death the African spirituality. What's deep was that when this man was in the prison cell, 
taking him to go heal the warden's wife. He stepped outside and looked up at the sky. He said, look, boss. He reached down, picked up the earth, smelled it. And said, here, boss, smell it. The white man looked at it and said, all right, man, come on. He couldn't tap into spirituality. He couldn't tap into the, he couldn't tap into the spirituality of the earth of creation. That's what's in us. That spirituality that told your great grandmother what to do when you were sick. Something inside her, that African spirituality would cause her to go outside and get into the earth. Get some stuff out the earth. Come in the house, you take it, and tomorrow, you better. Free your mind. Don't allow yourself to be bound by their program of religion. Please return to your spirituality. I guarantee you, a lot of stuff you've been trying to make happen, it'll just start happening, because you'll be in tune with the universe itself. When you get in tune with the universe, you can pull on the breast of the divine creation and get divine milk. All the strength you need, all the guidance you need, all the direction you need, all the wisdom you need, just because of who you are.